Cynthia Bradley King, who is a professor with the University of Pittsburgh's School of Social Work and the Center on Race and Social Problems. Good evening to you, ma'am. Hi, Lenny. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. To my right, I have Cheryl Hall Russell, who is the president and CEO of the Hill House Association and the Hill House Economic Development Corporation. Good evening to you, ma'am. Good evening to you. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for being here with us. Last and certainly not least, Becca Zalia Mgune is the founder of co-founder and director of programs and strategic partnerships for New Voices Pittsburgh. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. Now the reason why I brought this panel together in this construct is because we hear so much about civil rights and we mm -hmm. hear about leadership within the black community. But usually when we talk about solutions, it comes from reverend and men. It's usually a reverend somewhere and a man somewhere. But when you look at the makeup of what Pittsburgh looks like, two thirds of Pittsburgh households that are African American are led by black women. So it only made sense to me to start this conversation with black women on the panel. So with that said, I want to go to you, Dr. Bradley King, and ask, are we at the precipice of perhaps having a renaissance, whether it's here in Pittsburgh or throughout black America, to make all of America better? I would certainly hope so. Um, Pittsburgh has gone through several different renaissance. Um, I can remember when I was a very young girl and the population of the city of Pittsburgh was half of what it is now. Things have changed so much, so very much. So I would hope that that renaissance would continue. Cheryl, you, you're coming in from out of town and, and all of you all have different perspectives. I'm a native, but I'm coming in from out of town. Mm -hmm. With you being involved with the Hill House mm -hmm. and you're seeing some of the movements over the last couple of years, where do we stand as black Pittsburghers? Where do we stand as a society? Are we making that move to something higher, something better? Um, I'm always low to jump in uh, to have discussions about Pittsburghers in a, in a broad, uh, with a broad swath because I am a new Pittsburgher, um, three and a half years in. And so um, I have my observations about how I think things are going, but I'm still learning. Um, I am in the Hill District proudly and, and love what I'm doing there. Um, we are seeing a physical renaissance of, uh, of the Hill District. Um, we are working toward uh, both a physical and a renaissance of the people of the Hill District. Um, there's still, they're still real problems and they still are not uh, reaping the benefits of, of all of, of Pittsburgh. Um, we still have too many of our young people that are driving by the wonderful colleges and universities that we have and they're either going there to work, but they're not going there to learn, and we've got to figure out what these disconnects are. And so as an observer, that's one of the problematic things that I'm seeing and that we're trying to be a part of, of uh, correcting. Becca Zellia, New Voices Pittsburgh, you all have gotten involved to fill some of those voids, and, and what we've seen for the first time in quite some time is an infusion of young people, millennials, getting involved and, and putting basically their boots on the ground to say, this is not tolerable, there needs to be a change, and we're going to push for that change. Are we at the precipice of making the changes that we need, or, or is this the beginning of something tangible, significant, and long term? I think it's not the beginning of something, I definitely think it's a continuation of many, many years of hard work, um, of multiple movements, of multiple social movements. And what I think we see is visibility of young people because we have social media access, because they're courageous, and because we have to reiterate something that the civil rights movement was, and the black power movement, and all the social justice movements that black people have led, is saying that black life has value black life matters and so we are seeing a resurgence of visibility and I think that's why it's so palpable and even exciting and I think that's why people are getting involved and so it's this is building on the, the shoulders of our ancestors mm -hmm. it's not new but it is very visible and very palpable because you know we're seeing just an incredible amount of injustice in this time and people are tired of it. Becca Zello, you you mentioned the fact that you have to basically stand on the shoulders of ancestors. That's how you, you phrase that. How does the young generation now, those that are out there in the streets, those that have been talking about Black Lives Matter, those that have been talking about hands up, don't shoot, folks that have been protesting Trayvon Martin all the way through, how do they stand on the shoulders of people 50, 60, 70 years ago when it seems as though some of the issues that we're facing today are not quite the same as what they faced 50, 70 years ago? Well. I think everything exists in context and I think that ultimately, you know, it's it's ironic that a movie like Selma would come out at one of the, you know, just at the height of 
all of the energy around Black Lives Matter, and I think that it demonstrates the parallels mm -hmm. of what black people experienced during that time span. So you see police brutality, you see um, people being killed at the hands of police, you see people protesting peacefully, you see people asking for human rights, for voting rights. Our voting rights have just been challenged again mm -hmm. more recently. So we see parallels um, between the, the 60s and now that I don't think anything <laughs> has changed. I think the ways in which they're delivered, you know, the mode of delivery for the injustice is, a, is slightly different, yes. but black people are continuously facing the same issues. We've been asking for full citizenship and dignity for the entire time that we've been in America. And so th the issue has not changed. Is it something that now people are seeing the civil rights movement of the 20th century as an empowerment base for perhaps an civil rights movement of the 21st century for your generation? Um, I think that, I think young people today are just really bold and intelligent and, and, and courageous. And I think that they're challenging white supremacy. And I think that when we challenge white supremacy, we're being really radical and we're saying we need to uproot this. We cannot wait for reform after reform after reform because one of the reforms they're offering is to put uh, cameras on police that is not preventing police from brutalizing and killing people. They're, we're seeing it on film, and then people are still not being indicted. So we're asking uh -huh. for real change, which we've been promised by multiple politicians, you know, with the ushering of someone like Obama, who is definitely a symbol of, of change in the United States, but still, he has to... Um, he has to be courageous in his own ability to say, you know, black people need something completely different. And so he's walking in his own middle ground. So black people are just asking for the, the messaging of the movements yeah. remain the same. Equality, human dignity, human rights, full citizenship, to be treated as though we are human beings. And we are not being treated as though we're human beings. We're constantly criminalized. We're constantly forced to live in fear. And that is no way to live. Okay, so ladies, let me ask you two both this. And either one of you can jump in initially. How do we get to where we have this crazy juxtaposition where you have the first African American president, uh -huh. you have black politicians in power, mm -hmm. you have a black governor in, in Massachusetts, we've had a couple of black governors now, we've had black senators. But at the same exact time, it seems though other rights are going in the opposite direction. Voting rights have been challenged. The economic disparities that have been released by the Center on Race and Social Problems, they're widening. It's in a, in a very scary way. How do we get to this point in time? Did we drop the ball? How and why are we here and what do we need to do to reverse that? I think these things um, were expected or should have been expected. Whenever there are advances, there's going to be pushback from the powers that be. and. Um, the President of the United States, the, the one piece that so many people my age thought that they would never, never see, see, never see, uh, others didn't think it would ever happen either. And in a way, they don't want, they want to make sure it does not happen again. And there are, there's pushback in every area. Um, people are fearful of a change. People are always fearful of change. And I am so very proud of the young people today that they are so bold. But the one thing that's helping them, the one thing that I have always, um, I'm always complaining about, the internet. They are so connected now. They can get messages to each other across vast mileage. They can let each other know what's going on and pull together, get coalitions together. This is really helping them mm -hmm. as it helped the president become the president. These kinds of um, uh, technologies are really helping young people today fight the kind of discrimination, prejudice, and um, the degradation. They're fighting the degradation that my generation and the generation before me didn't have the opportunity to do that. They had to feel that they had uh, the ability to do better in their hearts, but they couldn't see it. They didn't see uh, an Obama. They didn't see black senators. They didn't mm. see black governors. So what's the fight look like now? Chair, I'm gonna ask you first. What, what, we, we know what the fight looks like. Let me rephrase that. We know what the fight looks like, uh -huh. but what does a win look like in mm. 2015? A win for African Americans in 2015. What does that look like moving forward? Because we know what the fight looks like. Mm. We've seen the die-ins, we've seen the protests, we've seen the movements through social media, et cetera. I, What's I a win look like? I struggle to put a, a date on a win. 
I think this is a continuous process. But what does it look like? What, what, what does it mean? What, what types of things would, would be in place when those wins come about? Um, for me, in the angle that I look at it, 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 it starts around education. Mm -hmm. um, the, we are receiving so many of the, the clients that I deal with on a daily basis are struggling with basic education. We have a new high school. It's a dropout recovery high school. We're getting kids who are testing in at, at fifth grade level on both math and reading. What do you do with that? Um, that is a prison in itself. And, uh, and so I, I think the, um, there, we're trying to be innovative around education, but we don't seem to be having much luck around the nation on changing these massive educational systems uh, and responding. I think we know intellectually and research-wise what we need to do in changing school systems, but the willingness for that kind of massive ch and innovation and change in education is uh, we've not been willing to yeah. actually embark on. So that, that for me is a win when we start to break down some of the barriers that keep our educational systems um, and not performing what to the level a, that they can. What does a win look like economically in 2015? What does a win look like when it comes to employment in 2015? We've had a lot of advances, but that double unemployment rate has been stubborn over the last 50, 60, 70 years mm -hmm. as long as they've kept it. Uh, it. The study came out from the center. What types of things should we be going after to change those disparities? Because as we well know, you change the economics, you change the education, you change you'll it. pretty mm -hmm. much change everything else in society. Mm -hmm. Right. We need more infusion of African American youth in the STEM areas, science, technology. You know, we need folks that are, are, are taking those higher um, courses in math. We need more infusion of that in our schools, the advanced practice courses that they're taking in high schools in um, affluent areas. We need those same things in our poor areas so that all of our children have the opportunity to advance. We're not getting that. Um, even at the university, we are seeing that um, our students make it there, mm -hmm. but they're not graduating at the same levels as uh, others are, they're not able to perform sometimes at the same levels because they haven't been prepared. And, um, and so this, this is where, where Black Lives Matter really comes into play because even if they get access into the system, it's not necessarily meaning that they're going to be able to break the tape and cross the finish line. Right. So what types of things should we be putting in place to make sure that that transpires? What types of things does your generation look to and say, we need these things in place that we haven't had before? People can give us scholarships, but if we don't have the education to get there, we'll never mm -hmm. qualify for the scholarships, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, thinking about the question on what wins look like, I think there are people who are launching campaigns for specific wins, right? So mm -hmm. talking about economics, a fight for 15. Like we see local activists trying to get a basic living wage rates of $15 an hour for people who are working in a variety mm -hmm. of different types of jobs. That's a win for our community Absolutely. immediately that we can say, you know, because like, to be able to cover the cost of living mm -hmm. and to think about black women and the fact mm -hmm. that they're in Pittsburgh specifically, that their medium income like is five dollars, their net worth rather is five dollars. And so when it comes to economic justice for black women and the families that we support, the communities therefore that we support, you know, having basic living wage covered would be one victory. And then all people really recognizing that, you know, we have to be we really have to change the policies that impact folks directly. And so one of the things that we were talking about, I think black people and young people specifically are tired of racial profiling. They're tired of mm -hmm. uh -huh. empty promises. You know, we think about um, the ways in which, for example, the stop and frisk issue is brought up. You know, ending stop and frisk is another campaign that if that policy is banned, that's another victory nationwide. Stay, stay right there. When we come back, what we're going to talk about or how the protest may have sparked a new movement here in the 21st century and how it can go from being moments pieced together to an actual movement that makes America better. Don't go anywhere. We're talking about that here on NT. Get to the point.